For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. This is clear and simple. It is speaking about false conversion. People who were never truly born again in the first place. That's why in the next verse, it says a dog returns to his vomit and a pig returns to wallowing in the mire. Dog and a pig are uh, animals of unsafe, representing unsaved people. And it's saying that they were a dog and they just returned to doing what a dog always does. They were a pig and they returned to doing what a pig always done, does. They were never a sheep. They were never a truly born again convert. They had an association with the gospel and with the church and therefore escaped the pollution of the world for a little while um, through the knowledge of Christ, not through faith in Christ or being born again regeneration, but just through the knowledge of Christ. And now they're even worse off um, because they almost found the way. They were so close to salvation and then they, they went back into deception. And that is something that's going to torment them in hell forever. It would have been better for them to have not have got close to salvation. The scripture isn't talking about someone that is born again, loves Jesus, but then they get entangled in deception and, well, that's it, they've lost their salvation. No, if you are born again and you somehow get entangled in uh, deception, you are still safe in Christ. You're gonna, you'll mess your life up here on earth and waste your life, but you are born again on your way to heaven. You are safe in Christ. Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ, both near and far. This is Trevor with Dying to Live for Jesus, and it is my mission to seek the once saved, just as James chapter 5, 19 and 20 tells all Christians to make it their mission to seek after those who were once saved, but may not always be saved because they have wandered away from the gospel. And today I want to get this idea out. I haven't heard anybody really speak on this or elaborate on this. I have a point of contention on once saved, always saved in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled and overcome, their end is worse than their beginning. And so I say to those who hold to once saved, always saved, look, clearly you can lose salvation, and that's what this passage is talking about. They've escaped the corruption of the world. What does this mean? They've turned from sin. They've repented. They're no longer defiled by sin. They've escaped it. And how have they done it? By knowing the Lord. So by the power of their genuine faith, I'll say, they escape the corruption of the world, and which is, which is sin. And I'll say, okay, it doesn't say point blank genuine faith. It says by knowing the Lord. But how else do you escape the corruption of the world? And those who believe once saved, always saved will come back. And this is namely the Lordship Salvationist, the Calvinist that I'm talking about. Those who believe that Christians will persevere and they will overcome to the end. But they'll say to me, this is describing mental ascent. They simply know about Jesus. They simply ascribe to the facts of Jesus. Okay, so this is where I want to have this discussion. What is this power of mental ascent to overcome sin? And why is it spoken of in absolute terms here? Meaning the same way that we say that those with genuine faith, every person with genuine faith will overcome. They will reform their actions. They will repent from sin. They will have works. We say this in, in an absolute sense because that's scriptural. Okay, there's nobody who believes in the Lord and continues on in sin. So are you saying that likewise, everybody in every situation that ascends to the facts of Jesus Christ, who has that mental ascent. It clicks for them, and they understand the gospel. They don't believe it. They don't trust in it, but they do understand it. Are you saying that every single one of them will reform their actions in the sense that this passage is talking about? They escape the corruption of the world. Is this the fruit of mental ascent without exception? And so if you say yes, this is going to raise a lot of other questions. Can you elaborate on this absolute power of mental ascent that is going to cause everybody who mentally ascends to Christ to walk in his ways temporarily? Okay, but let's say you say, well, no, that's not the way mental ascent works. It's not like everybody who comes to the facts of Jesus is going to be propelled into good works for a season and then fall out of it. This passage is referring to a specific group of unbelievers 
that accept the facts of Jesus and are like churchgoers. They believe in Jesus in their mind for a little while. They escape the corruption of the world. They stop drinking and they give up their pornography addiction. And then they leave the church. It's speaking specifically about those people. There's no power of mental ascent that everybody who mentally ascends will certainly do these things. It's just describing this group of people that does happen to do that. So let's go to verse 21. It would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on this sacred way of righteousness. So this statement is very much tying together this faith and those works, meaning that everybody who has this faith, if you're saying it's mental ascent or not, anyone who has this faith, whatever faith is spoken of here that causes us to escape the corruption of the world, will have those works. So even if it's mental ascent, this mental ascent would always cause you to have those works to escape that corruption. Because it's only when you turn from that way of righteousness, you turn from that type of faith, you turn from that mental ascent, if that's what you want to say, that that person would stop having those works, because that's what's being talked about in the passage. So you can't say there's somebody who has this mental ascent and doesn't have the works that go along with it, because the point of the passage is that by having that faith, they had those works that went along with it. So this is the glaring problem I see with those who hold to this interpretation of mental ascent for this passage. You're creating some type of power of mental ascent that's going to move those who have it to have good works and to ultimately fall away from it. So it's like this rule of mental ascent that everybody who comes to the facts of Jesus is going to walk in righteousness for a while and then fall away. Is that what you really believe? Is is that what you think exists? That anybody who ever ascribes to the facts of Jesus, who doesn't believe in their hearts, who doesn't trust will have good works for a season and then fall away. Is that what you believe? Can you elaborate on that? Something seems really off about that. And if you agree with that, that something seems really off about that, that there's some type of power of mental ascent that causes you to walk in the ways of Jesus and then fall away, that's what mental ascent does. I want you to consider that this passage isn't talking about mental ascent. It's talking about genuine faith. And that if a person, if a person comes to genuine faith in Christ and therefore overcomes sin in their life by it and then turns away from genuine faith, that person is going to be condemned. That makes, that makes a lot more sense because we know that there is an absolute go together between faith in Christ and works. Can we agree to that? That's established throughout scripture. There's a go together between the power that is trust in Christ, real genuine faith, and being delivered from sin. But this whole business about mental ascent being the power to deliver you from sin, and then you're ultimately going to fall away from it, I think that sounds a lot more suspicious. So guys, I want you to consider that this interpretation of this being mental ascent, it's really bogus. It creates some type of power of mental ascent that seems really off. And the clear interpretation of this passage is that it's talking about genuine faith. Those who had genuine faith for a while turned from genuine faith, which is the power to overcome sin. We lose that power to overcome sin. We go back into the world and we'll be condemned. That's really the only interpretation of this passage. But unfortunately, those who believe once saved, always saved are going to look past A, just the clear reading, the obvious indications in this passage that it's someone who's lost their salvation. B, they're not going to probably consider this type of logic. Are we really saying that somebody, everybody that mentally ascends has some type of paralleled power to overcome sin by a different source other than trust in Christ? That's not very logical, but that's something that they'll bypass as well. But lastly, they'll they'll cling to this part of this passage in order to throw all those things out. They'll say, 
well, look, as you, as you heard Ryan Rufus say, this is kind of his, his reasoning uh, to, to support what he's saying about these people not being real converts, even though the language is st- so strong that they are people who uh, experience genuine faith. But it says, the proverb says, a dog returns to its vomit, and a cow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. I'm sorry, a pig. A pig that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. And this is the classic mixing of some pretty complicated truths involving regeneration, involving the born-again new nature of God's elect sheep, and they're going to just apply that across the board to everyone who comes to genuine faith. And they're not going to make that distinction. And they're going to say, look, this talks about a new nature that this person doesn't have and never had. This person has never gotten the new born-again nature. Let's stop right there. They're correct so far. They're correct. These people did not receive a new nature. They did not receive uh, a born-again nature. They weren't regenerated. They weren't made a new creature. They didn't cross over from death to life. On and on. They're not elect. They're not sheep. But the classic, and I believe Calvin brought this about, or at least it was done in the time of Calvin, you don't see this before, the thing that creates once saved, always saved, is locking in regeneration with salvation. Saying that everybody everybody who's been saved has been regenerated. Scripturally, this is not true. There are unelect, unregenerated, saved people. And the evidence that they're unregenerated as saved people is when they lose their salvation. When they lose their salvation, it's going to show that they never had a new nature created in them. It's going to show that they were never regenerated. And God leaves this as a mystery for us. This is It's spoken of mysteriously when, when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus. He said, the, the wind blows whichever way it wants to. Okay, It comes and it makes you born again, just like you were made born the first time. You were not aware of it. It wasn't up to you. You were made born. It's the same with us. It's the same with us that are regenerated, okay? And it's a mysterious thing. I always compare it to the creation of Eve from Adam's body, okay? God came to Adam and said, look, this woman was made of you. And uh, the scripture doesn't even say that. We don't even know. And I'm sure Adam didn't know either. He didn't know that something was created from his own body. God could have either said, this woman was created from you, and Adam would have said, okay. Or he would have said, look at this woman, this is completely new, it has nothing to do with you. And Adam would have said, okay, because it was done mysteriously to Adam. We're regenerated the same way. We don't really know for certain that we're regenerated. We must persevere to the end, and if we persevere to the end, then we know that we have been regenerated. And I know this sounds much like Calvinism, but it's a completely different mindset because I know that if I don't persevere to the end, I'm not going to heaven. So I fear God and I make sure to do what he said to do. But if you believe that you've been regenerated and you see in scripture that for those who have a new nature, they can't fall away, God is going to keep them, which is true. It gives you a mindset that you can't fall away, that it's a false mindset. That's where once saved, always saved comes from. It is a mix-up or a locking together of two things that aren't necessarily locked together. We need to leave room for the fear of God, and we should not assume that we're the elect of God. So back to this passage, What's it saying about these people? What's it saying about these saved people? What's it saying about these genuine converts, these genuine believers? It's saying they were never born of God. It's saying they weren't regenerated. It's saying they always had the old nature. As scripture says, those in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. But God's people have been so brainwashed doctrinally now that when I use all of these terms about unregenerated people... You guys want to say, yeah, they're not saved. They were never saved. But that's not what Scripture says. Scripture shows a difference between the saved elect and the saved that are not elect. The saved that are regenerated and the saved that are not regenerated. And this is why salvation can be lost. It can't be lost for those who are regenerated. You you share the divinity and you're a new creature and this is God's plan. He's going to keep those that he has given his spirit and he's regenerated. But you can lose salvation because you may or may not be regenerated. Let me say that differently. You can lose salvation because you may not be regenerated. 
that's the truth. So these people, were they changed? Were they regenerated? These people who went back to their wallowing in the mud? No, they were not changed. They were not regenerated. But that's what we have to ask ourselves, us who have genuinely believed. We have to ask ourselves, are we truly the elect of God? Are we his children? Is God keeping us? We have to ask those questions, and God wants us to ask those questions. That's called God-fearing. That's called being a human and not God. That's called revering God. We have to leave room for his judgment. We're all going to be judged. And you can't do that if you're accepting this uh, Calvinistic era lie that everyone who's ever saved will always be saved because they're certainly the elect of God. We don't know if we're the elect of God. Uh, guys, I know, um, unfortunately, everything I'm saying today, it, 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 I don't hear other people really saying it. I'm not sure why God chose to reveal these things to me and apparently not to other people, but I hope you consider these things. Maybe there's people listening to this video that have other YouTube channels that can meditate on these things. And I honestly hope that this is something that gets promulgated because it's the truth. I, I hope that it trickles down in some way and it can break this lie, this very complicated, subtle, crafty little lie that has been inserted into the church of God in order to to make people just hook, line, and sinker go for this once saved, always saved, because it almost sounds scriptural. Come Lord Jesus, amen.